do see a lot of new faces here, which is great. Um, we have five scholars visiting us every year um, in the Women's Studies and Religion program, and uh, we're very happy to have Gwen Kessler among them. Um, Gwen received her PhD in rabbinics, specializing in Midrash from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Um, and uh, she published her first book, which was that based on your dissertation? Yes. Yes, and that was um, in 2009 from the University of Pennsylvania, Conceiving Israel, the Fetus in Rabbinic Narratives. Um, Lynn is visiting with us from Swarthmore College, where she is a professor in the religion department. Um, and uh, uh, she has a lot of other honors and publications that I'm not going to mention today uh, so that we can hear from her. Um, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> sorry, should have done that earlier. I'm going to stand because I'm more comfortable standing often. So. Um, I feel a lot of privilege lately and a lot of gratitude and luck, and um, definitely to Anne and my colleagues at uh, the Women's Studies and Religion program. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, okay, so I am gonna be presenting a, a lot, and <laughs> so I'm not sure what I'll get through. Um, but what you're going to be seeing today is the kind of the outline of my current book project, which is called The Crooked in the Street, Queer Theory and Rabbinic Literature. Um, it's a project I've been working on off and on for the past 10 years. Um, and I'm really, again, thankful to have the opportunity to um, progress with it a lot over the, the, next, the coming months. Um, and I'm somewhat new to PowerPoint and even newer to Keynote, so I apologize for the foibles along the way. So, uh, the first slide is going to be just give you a chapter outline of what's, what is in the book currently. I suspect that it will change a bit as books do. Um, but the introduction will probably stay, you know, at least on topic, where I will introduce the readers to rabbinics and queer theory, and I will talk about both rabbinic literature and queer theory to us in a few minutes. Um, the second chapter is going to be on mitzvot, commandments, and gender performativity. The third chapter is on rabbinic genders. The fourth is biblical figures as gender benders. The fifth chapter is on rabbinic figures, so not, not biblical characters, but um, rabbinic people, men. Um, and I'm going to look at homoeroticism and history. And the sixth chapter is on parables of gender. Um, it's on a genre of rabbinic literature called the mashal. Um, and the seventh chapter is going to be on the Song of Songs and some looking at contemporary queer theories turn to um, time. Um, and what we, how we think of the past, how we make usable pasts from different um, strands um, throughout history. And the eighth chapter is kind of where my newest interest lies, and that's at the nexus between critical animal studies and post-humanism um, and rabbinic literature. Okay. So now we'll back up a little bit. Um, and I kind of play in the title um, with um, this verse from Ecclesiastes, which is, that which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Um, so that's where the crooked and the straight comes from. Okay. Um, and I guess I use that, the crooked and the straight, to pun or to play with queerness and straightness. Um, so the topic that I, the, the body of literature that I work with as my primary text is called rabbinic literature. And it is rabbinic interpretations from the third through the eighth centuries of the common era. Um, it's an oral literature that's transmitted among the elite class of sages. We used to think we had access to kind of, I don't know, popular Judaism of the time, like the lay people's Judaism. And we have come of age as scholars in rabbinic literature and realize we, that however vast rabbinic literature is um, and the wealth of information that is there, um, it is generated by a group of scholars and represents their visions of what, I'm going to say, of who Israel is um, and what Judaism comes to be. Um, we talk about it in terms of time period, um, geog geographical provenance, um, genre, Midrash, Talmud, Halakha, and Agadah. Um, and it, a couple of the things you want to know is it's characterized by inter indeterminacy. Right, and multiple interpretations. So 
I like to say whenever someone says, you know, Judaism says X, as if there's only one thing, run, okay? Because it is often undermined. The Bible works this way too. It'll say something and then kind of be in tension with that same saying um, in another place, okay? Here's a little, my partner Tamara is here and she said that I need pictures. So <laughs> I'm working on that um, and color and beautiful things. So I'm obviously a text focused person um, and um, at least in my research. And so here's, here's some color, and there'll be a little more to come. Um, but it lays out the, you know, you will be seeing me um, attribute the text to their documents, but I won't necessarily kind of give a huge um, um, discussion of what the Talmud is or what Genesis Rabbah is. Um, but here's a quick little snippet to just maybe get our grounding so we can lose it later. Um, but the, the classifying rabbinic text by time period is represented here in the left column of Tanaitic Midrashim. So circa 200 CE, 220 CE. And of, so you have Tanaitic Midrashim. One of the things you do need to know, I think, is Midrash is really motivated or uses it as its base scripture, the Bible. And it goes and it comments on, it starts from, it doesn't really start from scripture, but let's just say for the sake of argument, it starts from scripture. It often starts from a scriptural um, irritant. Um, but it also starts from, you know, rabbis coming to the text with their own concerns and reading into that text as well, so it's a combination. At the same time around the 200 CE, you have this document called the Mishnah. Nobody really knows what it is, but it's super important, all right? Um, it is a foundational text to ancient Judaism, to rabbinic, well, it's a foundational text to rabbinic literature. Let me take the ancient Judaism back, because, right, there are ancient Jews living who don't care about the Mishnah at the time of the Mishnah. Um, and so the, the, the little that we know about the Mishnah, we know even less about the Tosefta, and we don't really know much about the relationship between the two, okay? Now that that's all clear, no. So the Mishnah used to be thought of as a legal, t a legal code, but it doesn't, it doesn't really work as a legal code. So I like to think of it as, you know, a compendium of oral teachings. And the Tosefta is, means additional material, um, but scholars have kind of, turned away from thinking that the Mishnah is the earliest Tanaitic text and the Tosefta adds to it, to going by a case-by-case -case basis and saying it says this in the Tosefta, it says this in the Mishnah, they're clearly related things, but I don't know which came first. Okay? And if you're really interested in that kind of academic work, you devise tools to try to figure out and make an argument of which comes first. For our purposes, we're, they're, you know, they're the, second, third century foundational text upon, and the Mishnah serves as the basis for both the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Palestinian Talmud, and the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, okay? And Amorik Midrashim, I have to say I'm a Midrashist, despite the queer Talmud nerd um, sticker that you'll, I mean, picture that you'll see, um, that you saw in the beginning and that you'll see at the end. Um, and so the Amorik Midrashim, again, are um, rabbinic commentaries commentary doesn't really work. The rabbinic exegetical explorations of um, biblical books. Okay, I, I don't like to say commentary because again, they like the Talmud, Midrashim like the Talmud, are characterized by um, differences of opinion, multiple options, instead of um, one answer to any given question, okay? So now that you know queer, um, rabbinic literature, we're gonna teach you queer theory. Um, feel free, if there, if there are people who have questions in the, in, at, at any point, please feel free to ask. Um, queer theory is a set of ideas based around the idea that identities are not fixed and do not determine who we are. It suggests that it is meaningless to talk in general about women or any other group, as identities consist of so many elements that to assume that people can be seen collectively on the basis of one shared characteristic is wrong. Indeed, it proposes that we deliberately challenge all notions of fixed identity in varied and non-predictable ways. I have a few more um, kind of ways to think about or enter into queer theory if we haven't thought about it before. Um, there is no critical consensus on definitional limits of queer, all right? Um, broadly speaking, it describes those gestures or analytical models which dramatize incoherencies in the allegedly stable relationships or relations between chromosomal sex, gender, and sexual desire. 
Queer marks a suspension of identity as something fixed, coherent, and natural. Okay, so again, one of the key things is this instability as opposed to stability of identities, okay? Um, and before we get to some of the key things that I think we can agree on about what constitutes queer interpretation and queer theory, I put some of these key thinkers' warnings up um, that, that really wanna tell us from the get-go that there's no easy way to define or delimit what queer is um, and is going to be in the future. So David Halperin says, queer describes a horizon of possibility whose precise extent and heterogeneous scope cannot in principle be delimited in advance. All right, and Judith Butler says, queer will have to remain that which is in the present never fully owned, but always and only redeployed, twisted, queered from a prior usage and in the direction of urgent and expanding political purposes and perhaps also yielded in favor of terms that do that political work more effectively. Okay, so in its, you know, um, constitution, as it were, right, queer um, holds this place of being unstable, right, and open to change and in flux, right? Now, despite all that, I want to talk about some central aspects of queer theory um, and that I think are going to be, that, are, that I come back to over time and that I work with in working with rabbinic texts. Um, and have in mind, at least for the, the book project, some of them will probably, there, there might be more that come in, but this is what I, I tend to come back to. Um, that queer theory reconfigures the relationships between sex and gender, all right? So it, it disrupts the, the kind of second wave feminist move to say gender is masculine and feminine and sex is male and female. And it, it sees those relationships in more complicated ways. Right? It doesn't understand biological self, sex as self-evident. And ju through Judith Butler primarily, sh um, and others though, the, the, w it, we think that sex is always marked by gender. So there isn't this place, even with physical bodies, right, or sexed bodies, where we can think of biological sex outside of the realm of what we know or think we know about gender, okay? So we don't actually have access to pure biology, okay? Because we are already speaking in a cultural matrix, okay? Um, a second key thing is that gender is performative. It's not something you are or have, it's something you do, right? And this will be key to a couple, actually like in many ways, much of the project. Um, and then uh, to take a quote from Butler to start to explain this, and again, we'll see, I think we'll see one of the interesting things for me about the rabbinic text that I'll talk about is as I struggle often as a teacher to explain this, right? How is gender not something we have, we're born with, we own, it's, it's our identity. Um, I think some of the rabbinic texts actually help um, to illustrate how gender is done through doing more than being. Okay, so hold on for that. Um, Butler writes, gender ought not to be conceived as a noun or a substantial thing or a static cultural marker. Again, you see this fluidity, this influxness, but rather as an incessant and repeated action of some sort. And the repetitiveness and this incessantness is gonna become key also. Right, the third thing that I think through with queer theory is that it tries to deconstruct the binary sex gender system. Okay, it's not, un they're, all of these kind of work together and they're not totally separable, but separable, but um, this means that it considers how binary sex, male and female, and gender, masculine and feminine, are challenged, and here this is gonna be key for me again, both through non-binary bodies and non-binary non gender performances. So I guess the third thing kind of brings, tries to bring together the first two um, aspects that I'm trying to say. Um, and again, what I wanna try to bring out in this talk and in the chapters of the book is kind of the um, impossibility of separating the embodied gender or embodied, we would say sex if we wanted to, but I would always prefer to use the term gender, um, the physical bodies and the actions that they perform in ways that both um, contribute to readings and hopefully disruptions of gender, okay? So I'm gonna pick up on that theme with gender performativity and meets vote. 
and go back to Butler, this is another quote about gender being something that one does, that solidifies through time, if it solidifies it at all, um, but isn't, doesn't kind of exist outside of action. She says, gender is in no way a stable identity or locus of agency from which various acts proceed. Rather, it is an identity tenuously constituted in time, an identity instituted through a stylized repetition of acts. And I want to pick up and say, and I've kind of thought this for a long time, ever since I read Butler in the 90s. I kind of feel like you were there when we discovered Butler, Jane. <laughs> so, um, and so, um, I always thought of that, the stylized repetition of acts, as a great way to think of mitzvot. So, right, we translate mitzvot as commandments um, or good deeds. They're, both of them are somewhat problematic on either end of the spectrum. Um, and so, the, so I want to play with that and kind of think through mitzvot um, as styli stylized repetition of acts, things that we do with our bodies. All right. One of the advantages for this, just as a side note, is that um, I am a text person who remains committed to kind of studying elitist literature of the past. Um, but one of the things that I learned through teaching religious studies was the value of what's known as lived religion and embodied religion. And, um, and so the looking at you know, what ancient literature at least says that people are doing with their bodies um, kind of has given a, a middle road between being a text person and a lived religion person, um, all at the, you know, trying to do that together. Okay, so I know it's a lot of text. It's too much text for PowerPoint. I get it, but I don't have handouts, and so just listen to what I want you to listen to and don't read the rest. Got it? Okay? I know people are ignoring me and reading even as I'm speaking. Okay? So you do that at your own folly. All right. So the, there are a couple of texts that I want us to know about, right? We're not doing in-depth text study. If you want to do in-depth text study, I don't know, go, to, go find yourself a chavruta and a study partner and do it or read my book if it ever comes out. But right now, <laughs> just look. All right, so remember, we're in the third, early third century in the Mishnah. We don't know what it is, all right? But um, it asks a question that is a great question to ask or maybe a problematic question from the get-go, wherever you stand. Mishnah Sota 3.8 says, what are the differences between men and women? There are a lot. That's why there's a lot of text. But, all right, and it starts by saying, the man must have his hair loosened and his, it, and his garments rent. All right? But the woman does not have her hair unbound and her garments rent. So I just want us to pause at the awesomeness of the surprise we might have when that's the first answer that comes to mind for this text of what are the differences between men and women. It doesn't start by saying their bodies are different. It doesn't even start by saying women are light-minded, which we have to look other places for, right, in rabbinic literature. But it starts with, in fact, the different ways that their bodies right, are involved in certain ritual practices. All right, and we know, and this is this. If you look at Leviticus 13:45, you'll you'll know that this is um, um, something you do if you contract leprosy. That's not really leprosy, but again, I don't care what it is for this purpose. Okay, um, so a man does X and a woman does Y. It's not a man has X, Y, right? Woman has. All right. So that's the first thing I want to note. So again, it's like the strangeness of, and just the first step of getting ourselves out of our place where we might answer that question and look where, where they've gone with it. Okay. The next thing they say, the man may place his son under the Nazarite vow, but the woman may not impose the Nazarite vow upon her son. Okay. The man may cut off his hair. Ugh. Um, for his father's vow of Nazariteship, but the woman may not cut off her hair for the vow of Nazariteship. The man may sell his daughter, the woman cannot. All right, again, I don't care so much about the details, but I want us to see where the text went. And obviously I care about that one detail. The man may place his son under the Nazarite vow, but the woman may not. So hold on to that, we'll come back to that. All right, another text that we sh can come to to look at, and we come to this text often in Jewish studies and rabbinic literature and gender, um, and it is a, it's a text from uh, Mishnah Kiddushin 1.7 that didn't make it, that got erased somehow. Um, all the mitzvot that a man is obligated to do for his son, men are obligated and women are exempt. Okay, so again, I want us to see that, that 
this is one of the major ways, not the only way, but one of the central ways that the rabbis are distinguishing between men and women, right? Um, and it's through obligations and what they're doing. It's not through the body, right? Um, it's through this performative what the body is going, what different bodies are going to do, right? And all mitzvot a son is obligated to do for his father, both men and women are obligated to do. All time, pound, all time bound positive mitzvot, men are obligated and women are exempt. And all positive mitzvot that are not time bound, both men and women are obligated. Okay, again, don't try to get all the details here because it's hard. Okay, so, but what I want to say is, one of the things that, I'll, bless you, I'll say very little with certainty about the rabbis. Um, what I will say with absolute certainty about the rabbis is they know the Bible. They know the Bible better than I will ever know the Bible. So um, they know that when they said, what's the difference between a man and a woman, that a man can make a Nazarite vow for his son, but a woman cannot, they, they know, like I knew, that in 1 Samuel 111, Hannah vowed a vow over her son. Right, saying, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid, oh, sorry, and remember me, and not forget your handmaid, oh, but we'll give to you, I really did proof it, um, but we'll give to you, but not this page, but we'll give to your handmaid a child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Okay? So they have to know that there's kind of a glaring contradiction in how they define men and women with the biblical Precedent. So, of course, they could say it's an exception, blah, blah, blah. I don't, but, but what I want to do is just point it out and point out their knowledge of this. So even at the space where they want to define the differences between men and women, they, they've, in, they've canonized exceptions. They've canonized instability right there in that ruling. Ruling is a little heavy, right? They're positing. They're like thinking out loud. Um, but we understand these things as rules. And again, that's probably our problem, not theirs. Okay, so again, the, um, if you just go back here, all the mitzvot that a man is obligated to do for his son, men are obligated. So, right, we're in the Mishnah. So we need the Tosefta and the Talmuds to help us with this because it's, well, what mitzvot is a man obligated to do for his son? Right, we don't actually know that. And the Mishnah doesn't pause to tell us. It either assumes we know Right? or it's leaving it to the future to decide. All right? But it turns out that as early as the Tosefta and certainly in the, Midrash, I mean in, the, in the Talmuds, one of the things a father is obligated to do for his son or to his son is to circumcise him. All right? So women are not obligated to do that. It's always a question of are they not obligated? Does that mean they're not allowed? But again, the finer point of this, I'm not going to be so interested in, but I do want to say that. So, so what we have is another scriptural counter example. Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and threw it at his feet and said, surely a bridegroom of blood you are to me. Right, so again, in that trying to situate men and women, um, there is a, already kind of a glaring problem. Okay. The Babylonian Talmud did not need, you know, the rabbis didn't need any feminists in the 20th century to point out contradictions or even any medieval codifiers to point out contradictions in their literature. They already knew they were contradicting themselves. So in the Babylonian Talmud commenting on that Mishnah about which mitzvot people are obligated to do, right, they're asking, but there are the mitzvot of eating matzah on Passover, rejoicing on holidays and assembling, which are positive time-bound commandments Right, which women are not supposed to be obligated to do, and here they are obligated, right? Not just allowed, but clearly obligated. And behold, behold, the text continues, Talmud Torah, procreation, and redeeming the firstborn, firstborn son are not time-bound, but yet positive commandments, yet women are exempt, okay? So again, I put this here just to point out that it's one, the, the rabbinic literature goes to different places than we might expect them to go when trying to figure out what the differences between men and women are or what is a man and a woman. Um, and they kind of know that any easy answers are complicated or fraught with problems. Okay. Questions before we move on? Um, is the word time-bound part of the translation? Yeah. 
Yeah, and then there are, there are non-time bound commandments and time bound, but yeah, okay. All right, so the third part of the, this presentation, which is probably the second chapter of the book, is on rabbinic genders. So we've kind of been introduced to male and female. We might not yet exactly know what they are. We know that they're fraught with contradictions. Um, and so the next part, the next thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about the variety of rabbinic, of genders in rabbinic literature. So male and female we've already met. We're not gonna spend a lot of time, but in my work on the androgynos, what I discovered was an interesting turn of a couple of phrases in, in early and later in Tanaitic and, and Amoraic rabbinic texts, which is, so we have, a, we have, we do see men and women, we just saw them, but interestingly in, enough, we see categories of fully male or certainly male or doubtful maleness, right? And so we see, like, so Ben Gamor, right, a fully, fully boy, right? And, uh, and a um, ish, ishavadite, right? A certainly woman, right? And so I'll, even though I'm not gonna talk about this, what I wanna say is that the fact that like male and femaleness itself, right, that we tend to think of in binaries are already not binaries in rabbinic literature, right? There's, there's I don't exactly know what a full, full male is, but I know it's different than a regular male, right? And so in contemporary um, gender studies language, right, we see differences or alternative masculinities maybe, or we just see a multiplicity where we are looking often or expecting binaries, okay? So again, not really gonna talk about them, but to, just to say that the categories of male and female are themselves fractured, okay? And then we, we have the androgynos, who I'll talk about a bunch. The tum tum, which I won't talk about so much. Um, the saris, there are actually two um, um, sarises. Um, the one who is uh, born that way and the one who makes themselves that way, or is made that way by, a, by another kind of occurrence, uh, bodily injury. Um, and then there's the ilonit, okay? Um, and one of the key texts for the androgynos, we're gonna spend a little time on this androgynos figure because I feel, again, it's another way, even though I, I hope we've already complicated maleness and femaleness um, and a binary of it, the, the androgynos for me is also a, a figure that complicates um, such, a, such a binary thinking of gender, okay? Um, the Mishnah, again, in the Mishnah, and androgynos is in some ways like men, and Z is in some ways like women, and Z is in some ways like both men and women, and Z is in some ways like neither men nor women. So I apologize for the typos in the previous um, handmade text. This is not a typo. So right, um, as we struggle with language um, in, the, in the late 20th and early 21st century um, for pronouns um, for non-binary gender um, people, one of the um, suggestions was to use Z and here um, instead of his and hers. And, she and he, and so I play around with this. Typically when I write in scholarship, I, I kind of take the same um, tactic that I, for the androgynos that I take for God, which is nice actually now that I think of it, and I just say, right, so I never, I don't gender God, I just say God, 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 and I've had to restructure sentences and you know paragraphs to not pronoun God, and I kind of think the androgynos deserves that kind of respect as well. Um, and so I often just, you know, say the androgynos. Um, and yet I keep, I'm not, I'm not perfectly happy with that, so I keep trying. And so one of these um, is to, one of the, one of the things I've, I'm doing is playing here with a, a third option for a pronoun. Um, so I, although, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, so, an andro um, so that's the opening line. And already we have this acknowledgement, this, there's an androgynos person um, that is both that is like men in some ways and like women in other ways, and I feel like it, right there it starts to collapse the binary, okay? Um, the, again, the text can, goes on and says, how is Z like men? Z conveys uncleanness with white like men, right? So seminal um, emission, and dresses like men. That's according to the mission of the Tosefta. Remember, we don't know the relationship between the two, but sometimes they are on topic and say, Interestingly, things interestingly diverse things. The Tosefta doesn't say and dresses like men, but says does not dress or cut your hair like men. Okay, 
and marries a woman but is not married as a woman like men, and Z is obligated to all the mitzvot stated in the Torah like men. Again, the point for me is not for us to get mired in the details of these, um, but to say, right, what's the answer? The answer is not about what this person is or what gender they have, but what they do or what the consequences are of being in a certain type of body. All right, so again, even though this is in a section necessary, like kind of on bodies, and we think we've left gender performativity behind, we can never leave performativity behind, nor can we ever ignore the fact that there are human bodies doing those mitzvot. Um, so the, the kind of the, both, both the gender and the embodiment work together. All right, so that's what I wanted to get to there, is that, again, the answer for you know, talking about gender has to do, has ramifications, and I think has to do with what people do with their bodies. All right, it continues, how is he like both men and women? One incurs guilt for hitting or for cursing here, like both men and women, and anyone who kills here unintentionally is exiled, and who kills her on purpose is put to death, like both men and women. I was gonna take that out, but social justice I kind of wanted to put it in, right? So this person, right, this defying classification, their humanity is never in doubt, right? There is no license for hate crimes, there's no license for violence, all right? Whatever you do to this person, is treated as, as if you are doing it to, you know, a human being, okay? Um, now, here is the, the last line of the, the um, text that I'm gonna talk about, which is Rabbi Yossi says, after delineating, right, so you get the format, it says, here are the ways, like an androgynous person is in some ways like men, in some ways like men, women, um, how is it like, men? how is the androgynous like men, how is he like women, how are they like neither, right, both and neither, and then the text finishes, and says, Rabbi Yossi says, an androgynous is a created being unto herself, and the sages could not determine about her whether Z is a man or a woman. But the tum tum is not like this. Sometimes Z is a man and sometimes Z is a woman. Right. The purpose for me here again is, um, I read this text as a, kind of an open acknowledgement that the, that the rabbis can't dis determine how to um, classify this person and say this person's unique. And I, they don't have to be classified in every instance. There are places where they're gonna have to be classified, but lo and behold, those places don't end up being consistent. So that, to me, again, is a way to say the rabbis have an inkling, right, of non-binary gender, okay? Next thing, I'm gonna spend less time on the, um, the Saris Chama, um, but just to say that the, I, there's, an, there's the thought that the Saris Chama and the Ailonit are not, it's not about gender for the rabbis, it's about procreation, and neither of them can procreate. And so I still feel like that while that might be true, that the issue is that they're non-procreative people, I think there's other language for the rabbis to talk about being non-procreative. Um, and so there's something about the categories of Saris and Ailonit and their descriptions, especially if you look at the, both, the, uh, the Ailonit has a deep voice, which cannot be distinguished as a man or woman's. The Saris has a higher voice that cannot be distinguished. I don't think these, these, these people are unmarked or these characters are unmarked by, by um, um, the category of gender. And I think, again, they show um, the, um, uh, the rabbis thinking more expansively about gender and, and, and also about maleness and femaleness. Okay. Um, so I'm leaving to probably just do the next section that I'll get through and then open it up for questions. Um, um, and this is my, so the, this is the moving from actually what's mainly halachic texts, right? So Mishnah and Tosefta texts um, about the androgynos and the tum tum. Um, moving to more midrashic sources, right? The sources that are connected to scripture, as opposed to necessarily the Mishnahs. And um, and I have found these are some of the characters that I found that um, seem to be, you know, um, um, beyond male, beyond binary thinking in, in rabbinic literature. The first one is Adam Adam Harishon, as androgynous. So we haven't left the androgynous too far behind. Um, and then we're going to talk briefly about Sarah and Abraham as tumtumim. Okay, 
Joseph is queer. So I'm playing around here. I, again, this is part of the part of my work is in scholarship is to figure out, it's a, it's a vexing question that maybe doesn't seem to be at first, but what terms do I use for ancient texts, right? And so I have felt comfortable talking about the androgynos as the androgynos and not trying to say this is a trans person or this is an intersex person, right? But just to say, I, the modern category isn't gonna fit because you know what? It's not a modern text. But there is a limitation sometimes in cutting off so much of the present from the past and making a hard and fast distinction between them. Because what we, one of the things we do as scholars and one of the things we do as queer scholars is, is it's queer or not actually, is try to reach into the past, right? And have a conversation. And a lot of queer theory talks about really kind of tangibly touching that past, reaching out in, in that past in a really emotional way. And so here, I, you know, I'm playing with, I'm using, for the androgynos, I'm using the text term for the androgynos. For the tomb tomb, I'm staying in the, in the, in the language of the text. Um, for Joseph, I'm just like, whatever, you know, all shots, you know, all, <laughs> all bets are off, and we'll just call him queer, all right? Dina, M to F is a little more complicated, and there's like scare quotes all over that, all right? It's all uncapitalized. Um, because I want to destabilize the M, I want to destabilize the T, and I want to destabilize the F, which means I want to destabilize, and I think these texts destabilize maleness. I think they destabilize the two-ness, right? That bef once you were this, and then you're that, and I think they destabilize femaleness. So, you know, I'm playing with it and trying to um, complicate it at the same time. Mordechai, I'm going to call him genderqueer. They're, they're fungible, right? I, in other contexts, I'm really happy calling Sarah and Abraham genderqueer. Again, we'll see the text in a minute. And God, asterisk, I feel like I just want to put the asterisk after, like we've moved to, in trans theory, put the asterisk to hold the place of trans theory that hasn't been written yet, trans bodies that we don't know, that won't be easily subsumed. So, and so we write an asterisk, as opposed to deciding, is it transgender, is it transsexual, is it, right? So trans, and then asterisk. So I wanna do that with God. And the, the quote of the most trans of all is from my 10-year-old son. Um, so thank you, Toby. All right, um, the, so my androgynous figure is from the, the first human, Adam Harishon. Um, the verse in Genesis says, and God said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness. And God created the Adam in God's image. In the image of God, God created him. Male and female, God created them. Okay, so it's a vexing verse. We can't, I'm not, I'm not gonna solve it here today. If you guys know the solution, you can tell me in the question and answer section. Um, I kept the him here. I mean, the, the God created him um, to mark the singular, but in another context, you know, I might have changed it to God created here. Um, male and female, God created them. I love the them because another pronoun that, that people are embracing um, for non-binary is them. And I love now that we've come around to having an option for what is going on in this verse where it moves from singular to plural. So I like the them. Right? And it doesn't, and it doesn't have to provide like for you know for my generation it's like but it's plural. What do you do with the singular plural? And you know, younger people have decided it's not a big deal. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so you've got the biblical verse, right? And and the what I wanted to do is show the rabbinic interpretation of that, lest we think you know various things that been that have been thought to make that first Adam non-androgynous, right? The, there's a text in um, Genesis Rabbah, it's a fifth century um, Midrashic compilation, and paralleled in Leviticus Rabbah, also the fifth century. And it says, um, Rabbi Yirmiyah ben Elazar said, when God created Adam, God created here androgynos. As scripture states, male and female, Z created them. So again, I decided, I, instead of just translating, right, God created, I, I did the Z capitalized for God. I'm just playing with language and seeing what the options are and what we'll take. Um, so, right, it kind of, that's a, a text that just says it like it read it, right? That God created this being androgynous. And like it says it in scripture, guys, what's the issue? All right? So there's another, there's another text. So one of the real interesting things about Genesis Rabbah in this, in this text is that they try to, I mean, 
most commentators or most scholars have tried to like flatten this text and say, oh, see, there's an androgynos, like Adam Harishon is androgynos. But th the three statements, or at least the first two statements are, are different. The third statement is to never, always gets dropped off of the conversation. And so I'm trying to bring that third one back, but I also just want to point out the differences between the first and two. The second opinion, as Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said, when God created Adam, God created here two-faced, right? Not like the Batman um, villain, um, but right, androgynous, we think, but back to back. Um, and God sawed here and made here two backs, one for one side and one for the other. So I'm gonna, so this morning I was going over screen, the, the um, slides, despite the handmade fiasco, and I, um, and I, I looked down at the Hebrew, and I, and, I and I had had this translated, one for male and one for female, which is how everybody translates this text. If you look in the Hebrew, there's no mention under Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman's comment that one side was for male and one side was for female. I'm sure it's implied. Like, I get it. But what was really interesting to me is like, the translators, and myself included, just went along and read binary gender into that statement, where uh, I think it's lurking, but I don't have to embrace it. So I took male and female out, because it's actually not in the text. And that makes a nice transition to the third text, Rabbi Tanhuma. And again, these are presented right after each other. There's, I've edited a little bit of, the, um, of, of some of the fluff you know, actual scriptural exegesis that's going on in here um, to take that out for us. But the third one is, Rabbi Tanakhum in the name of Rabbi Benaya said, when God created the first human, God created here a golem. And Z stretched from one end of the world to the other. As it is said, your eyes have seen my unformed shape. And that's, and the text kind of continues to expand this Adam and, and leave the binary of male and female behind. Um, and so, I like that about it, and I like the three in conversation with each other, okay? Um, so Abraham and Sarah will go through this. I'm gonna take about seven more minutes to get through the queer, underbending biblical figures, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, in a text in ba the Babylonian Talmud, um, it's actually all about, uh, the, the, it's a long passage about fertility and infertility and why the patriarchs and matriarchs can't have um, have not have struggled to have children, and one of the unique things about it is they actually don't just rush to think that it's all the barrenness is only the woman's issue, and they they talk about um, both of the 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 figures who you know with infertility. But in the midst of this, they say Rebbe Ami stated Abraham and Sarah were originally tum tumim. So tum tumim are people we don't know what their gender slash sex is. That we think that it means they're, they're, they have a, like a layer of skin or they're covered by, their genitalia are covered. And if you cut, if you perform surgery, apparently according to the text, the, it will be um, revealed what sex they are. And yet there are texts where that is, that, that simple, more simple, um, description or definition is undermined as well. So, but that's the, right, we don't, there, there's something about their genitalia that is not normative. Um, and then how do we know that they were tum tumim? Because there's a verse in Isaiah that says, look unto the rock whence you were hewn and to the hole of the pit whence you were dug. And the next verse says, look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bore you. All right, so, right, God had to, um, um, sculpt a penis for Abraham and dig out a vagina for Sarah. Okay, but God waited until they were 90 and 99. So for much of their life, they were non-binary gender. Okay, uh, Rabbi Nachman said in the name of Rabbi Arba, um, Bar, <laughs> Rabbi Bar Abuha, Sarah, our mother, was an Ilonite. As scripture states, and Sarah was barren, she had no child. She did not even have a uterus. Um, so again, we didn't spend that much time on the Ilonite, but um, it's the, you know, a figure of, I, th I think, that has a female figure with um, non-feminine normative gender markers. Okay, so the, again, so in one text, the rabbis are, you know, 
they don't seem to be upset necessarily about calling their um, patriarch and matriarch, right, their father and mother, um, Tum Tumim and Anilonit, right, these non-normative genders. Okay. Joseph, that's a picture. All right. She told me I needed pictures, but she didn't pick the picture. So, all right. Um, so Joseph was 17 years old. Right, we'll go through this relatively quickly. He was 17 year, years old, but you, st you say being still a youth, right? The text says he was a youth. Um, rather, he was behaving in the ways of youth, not a root, or of young women, not a root, right? We don't have that vocalization in the, in the manuscript, so I don't know exactly how to um, um, vocalize that text, right? I actually like both of the options, and I would probably keep both in play. Um, and talk about the differences for both of, you know, both of them. But um, what does it mean to act in the ways of youth, or what does it mean to act in the ways of young women? He was penciling his eyes, fixing his hair, and lifting up his heel, right? So he's wearing makeup, um, making his, you know, blow drying his hair, and walking in high heels, all right? Um, the Dina is the penultimate um, text I'm gonna look at. Um, and there's a text, it's in Genesis Rabbah, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Pazi said to them, the essence of Dina's creation was male, but from Rachel's prayers that said, may the Lord add to me another son, Z was made female. Okay, so it's kind of a great text, and I talk more about it in the book about fetuses, um, because it does, it has um, God changing um, Dina's gender from male to female um, in the, in when, when Leah is pregnant with her, okay? And there's a lot of gender like um, flips going on in this text when you relate it to the Mishnaic statement that it's commenting on that I don't have time to go through um, here, um, but I do see it as a, as a text where this and the next text and arguably some of the other texts, what I, what I usually frame them under kind of body malleability, right? So the physical body for the rabbis isn't quite as fixed as we might think. Um, so it's not just this gender performativity, oh, you, act, you, know, you can do certain things, but it is the malleability of the physical body that, again, we've been thought is, doesn't exist. I think that their texts kind of allow for more it, embodied fluidity than we kind of tend to think or have been taught to think. I think this is, oh, that, there's Mordechai and then there's God. Um, <laughs> I forgot God. So Mordechai, um, is about to nurse, right, breastfeed his uh, niece uh, Esther. So the rabbis said, every man of whom it is said in scripture that he was fed and sustained others. Now this is insane. It's like the word the, right? It's like it, reading a book and anywhere it says was, right, that, that meant something. And you have to assume that it said was often. But I actually think Again, the rabbis were better readers of scripture than me, and I kind of wonder, I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm wrong, and they might be onto something that there is a uniqueness to this, but I'm not sure. I have to check that. All right, the point is, right, the text shoots back, what, did Mordechai feed and sustain? What did this guy do? Right, Rabbi Yudan said, one time he went to all the wet nurses, but could not find one for Esther, and thus he nursed her. Right, again, it's part of the miraculousness. Right? There's a parallel in Babylonian Talmud about an, an unnamed man who nurses his um, son um, what, that, that is interesting to see in light of this. But, but what's interesting to me um, for both the Dina text and for the Mordechai text, and really for that matter for any gender text, right, in the mind of the rabbis, right, different for some of us, when we think about gender and gender malleability and body malleability, um, the, the one who is... Who is making the bodies malleable, right, is God, right? God is providing that miracle um, um, for Mordechai. God is said to be changing Dina's gender from male to female. Anyway, Rabbi, the text continues and it tries, it's, you know, it, it starts to work its way in, like, tries to think about this, as does the parallel text. Rabbi Brechi and Rabbi Abahu and Rabbi Elazar's name said, milk came to him and he nursed her always. Um, when Rabbi Abahu expounded this publicly, the congregation laughed. He said to them, is this not a Mishnah? Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar said, the milk of a male is clean. So, the, I, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting continuation to the text, right? Because we've hit upon something that might 
make not, no sense and that people will be uncomfortable about, and so the congregation laughs. And the retort is, is not good news for women or feminists, um, and I haven't really talked about some of the tension between queer interpretations and feminist interpretations. I'm happy to address some of that. Um, it's because I won't get to the part of the talk where it's even it's where it's really clear. Um, the the um, the the answer is of course you know it says in a Mishnah which is a gender coded male text right the rabbis are studying this text the women ostensibly aren't except for the exceptions of women who would be. Um, and so the, the, the nervousness about the gender and body malleability is supposedly assuaged by, right, saying this male text and this halachic text, right, um, explains that this, and not only does it, does it give us the context for men lactating, it one-ups one it and says, right, men's breast milk is better than women's. Okay. And the last thing, the uh, last is God. And, we can do this quickly because it's, in many ways, one of the key texts for this is that same text about God created Adam in God's image, male and female, God created them. Right? You don't have to go much further to say, wait, the text isn't actually just an anthropology, right? It's a theological statement. Okay. And so, um, and not only, so you go there, and then there's a bunch of other verses in, um, the Bible, where um, God's gender seems to transcend or combine um, or otherwise mess with binary gender. Okay. And then, again, to look at that last rabbinic text and say, um, the, I mean, the rabbinic text about the androgynous and that where um, Adam is created male and female and God saws them, to understand that right for in the rabbinic world, there would never be any sawing in two of God. So whatever the interpretations about Adam are, where you know the androgynous person is separated or, or um, um, cut from male to female, um, the, the, you wouldn't say that about God. God would exist more in this state that is a unified um, beyond binary, though. Um, being. I'm going to do the last. So since we're talking about God, um, right, I started with, an, with the Ecclesiastes verse that said, that which is queer cannot be made straight, which is the second verse here, but Ecclesiastes always already also says, in very similar terms, consider the work of God for who can make straight what God has made queer. Um, so um, I like the, that both appear um, in that text, um, and it do, does kind of answer um, that there is, right, that God is doing a lot of this queerness or is in control of a lot of this queerness. Actually, there's a positive and negative message, so we can talk about that. Um, and then I just wanted to say that, to stop there, um, and give a shout out to a, a friend of mine's queer, well, a traditionally radical yeshiva, um, and I stole um, her um, product for the flyer that hopefully you guys saw and came out with. Thanks. Sorry about we that. I understand. Just uh, thanks for coming. And um, uh, let's have Laura. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That one's live. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to ask this question because it's hard to talk about this about without falling into binaries, mm -hmm. including the one that I'm kind of curious about, the late 20th century feminist distinction between sex and gender. Um, but as I listened to you, I began to wonder if this fixation on true womanhood or true maleness is actually a very limited period in history, 
maybe from the Enlightenment to the 20th century kind of biological thinking, because what I was thinking about all the way through were the early modern examples that I'm familiar with in early Anglo-American history. And so I kind of want to ask you, uh, in kind of a crude way, um, what you think these people are talking about. Are they talking about physical bodily anomalies? Or are they primarily talking about behaviors like Joseph using eyeshadow? Um, and I'm, the two examples I'm thinking of is a court case in 17th century Virginia where a servant really was indeterminate mm -hmm. and was searched by the women and searched by the men, and they could not decide that this person was male or female, and so required a bonnet and breeches. Mm -hmm. um, but then you've got Queen Elizabeth in her speech to the troops at Tisbury, you know, I have the body of a woman and the heart of a, a king. So I, I, it's probably an unanswerable question, but I just wonder what you think's going on. What are they, uh, what are they doing with these texts? What kinds of problems are they solving? I, I think that. You know, I don't, I'm hard pressed to say it's one or the other. Um, I do think that the anomaly um, for the rabbis plays well into it. I think they are thinking and they typically think along. They're, you know, like other people, very interested in places where binaries break down or at least theoretically break down. So I think, I think the answer is both. And, you know, that, that, um, that there is a, there is an indeterminacy to the body that they see and know. Um, and I don't, you know, I mean, I guess I would have to say the gender performativity part of their reading mitzvot as, you know, repeated acts of, I, 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 I don't think it's intentional. I, I mean, I think my reading of it is um, a, a valid reading of it and does show that with the kind of the point, if this wasn't clear about all that, is the, of harping on that is that it makes every it makes every day everything open to gender subversion, um, and so I think it's the it's the count it's the other side of having a rigid binary. And I think they were aware of that though somehow. I think because of because so I think they play together. But I do, I think I'm taken by your statement about this, the, the second wave feminist um, um, smallness in terms of, you know, time scope um, with that. And I think that that's really interesting. And, and uh, actually, and do want to say that it was completely necessary mm -hmm. to separate sex and gender in the context in which it was done. And I'm thankful that that was a second wave feminist move um, because it, you know, gave me access to various things. So I'm not angry about that. Um, and, um, but I do, but I do like to historicize it and see, um, see that, that it, it has, it's been, it's being rethought too. Is that that relationship? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gwen. I think it was wonderful and fascinating. But I wonder, though, um, one can get the impression after your lecture that the rabbis really um, praised um, gender, uh, the, the, this blurring of, of uh, gender identities. And, and I wonder if we don't have here to distinguish between the descriptive and the normative. I mean, this, this trip, descriptively speaking, I, I, I totally agree with you, and the sources are speaking for themselves. They weren't embarrassed by... Um, all those categories that in between male, the male and the female. But the question though is whether they uh, um, praise it or I, I, I think, tell me what do you, do you think about that, uh, you think about that. I'm not sure that they, uh, the, that normatively speaking, uh, they really wanted it. I, I think that the movement within all these deliberations within the Mishnah and the Talmud is towards fixing 
um, uh, categories, I mean fixed categories, the male and the female, and all those in between, they just wanted to know if halachically speaking or uh, for other circumstances, to know if this is a male or a female. So the, discussion, the discussions are really blurring identities, but the movement is toward the opposite direction, I think. Yeah, so there are two answers. One is, I don't care. Yes, I'm like, so one is I don't care, right? Um, as, a, as a queer person um, who wants to construct gender, right, in the 21st century, I don't care what the rabbis thought. Um, I'm gonna use their texts as I would like and they give me openings to do so, okay? The second, as a scholar and historian, right, who wants credibility and a job, um, you know, unless the first answer will get me a more lucrative job, but it hasn't yet, um, is the, is that I think that they, so yes and no, I think that they do, especially, I'll, I'll talk about the androgynos because I know that stuff most. Um, the current reading of it, of, of the androgynos and the text about the androgynos is that the rabbis, in fact, are at odds, at pains to um, decide whether the androgynos fits into the male or female category. Um, and, and they do that despite that text that says, Rebbe Yossi says, the androgynos is a being in and of th themselves. So, so there's a kind of, the, and, and all, their answer to that is they throw that text away. They just, they, they get rid of it, or they read it in a kind of cockamamie way. So what I mean by that is there's an insistence that the, androg that the androgynos is made to fit into the halachic categories of men and women, but the texts don't bear that out. I actually, and if I cared more about halacha, I would talk more about this, but the, the halacha actually changes for them. It's all through midrash Tanaitic Midrashim, early midrashim, where the halakha shows elasticity. It, everybody is reading these texts um, that, that I'm in, I don't know what's happening in Shuvot and, and in contemporary, you know, outside of scholarly concerns, but they're, most, most people are reading it as if the androgynos has to fit, and I don't understand how they read it that way. I see the halakha changing and expanding to accommodate them. Now, it doesn't mean that they're normative, it doesn't mean that they're gender liberators, it doesn't mean that they don't see the world in binary ways. But, it do, but I do think that if we go to the halakha expecting a male-female schema that's gonna, gonna be um, there, then we're not gonna see the places that it's looser. Now, and, and some of the places it is um, maintained, but in other places it's not. So, there, so that's, I don't know if that answers, but you know, yeah. But I wouldn't paint them as gender liberators. But I do think the important work of queering them is to do that they did think that there's a difference. I mean, they understood the malleability of bodies. And you know, on some level, um, politically speaking, uh, it's not how I understand gender, but if they're gonna attribute gender changes to God and miracles, so be it. So I thought this was a fabulous talk, and the, the texts are great, and the way you, you read them and approach them is so rich, and I can't wait to read your book like everybody else. Um, I'm just curious about something, because uh, there are certain eras in history when there seemed to be a preoccupation with boundaries uh, more than in other periods. And um, as you were talking, you know, one of the things that we get from feminist theory, feminist scholarship, is uh, the insight that gender is sometimes used to speak about something else uh, at the same time. So I'm just wondering whether you might consider this in the historical context and say, are they talking also simultaneously about who's a Jew uh, and what are the boundaries of Jewishness and how to incorporate uh, people not born Jewish into a Jewish community to find them Jewishly, et cetera. Because so many of these metaphors seemed to strike me that way. And, and I guess also because um, recently reading some new work by Israel Yuval, I started wondering about the ways in which these might also be polemics against certain Christian claims regarding purity and gender, and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, um, I think for sure. I think, I think, and I should have been clearer about this, at least to throw this out, because I, I, when I've done this in writing, uh, I think I've tried to note this and not get mired in it, but it's huge. 
the answer that the androgynos, the answer that the Mishnah text and the androgynos text is asking is not what's a male, who is a male or female, it's who is a Jewish man or a Jewish woman, if they use the word Jew, which they don't. So, right, it's really asking what does it mean to be an Israel male, you know, a, a man in Israel and a, and a woman in Israel. Absolutely. I don't think you can separate the gender and the ethnicity in it. Um, so yes to that fully. Now, in my opinion, do these texts have, always have Christianity looking, like, looking, do they feel that, the, that, right, so sometimes there's a polemic, but I don't think as often as Yuval thinks. Um, so yes. And I think that they have, uh, but, but, but you can't, it's a, it's a problem in the way that we departmental, right, um, make disciplinary boundaries, but I think in gender studies or ethnic studies that I don't think you can in many ways um, um, see them as separately here. Yep. Yeah. Gwen, going back to um, going back to what you said a couple of minutes ago about one's approach to halakha predetermined predetermining what, what, what we'll see. Have you had the opportunity to present your work to any orthodox scholars? And if so, what was their reaction? Did you have to duck? <laughs> I, I haven't presented it. I mean, I suspect there are, um, there have been, you know, orthodox or observant people in audiences where I've presented, but not, you know, I haven't gone, like not to a primarily Um, first of all, thank you. Second, I'm curious if you had to or even feel as if you could give a one or two sentence definition of um, how you think the rabbis would answer the question, not what's the difference between a male and a female, but actually what is a man slash boy or what is a woman slash girl. And part of what's behind that question for me is again, kind of revealing what are some of the concerns of rabbinic culture and then what spaces might that open up for us today in rethinking how we might answer or teach others to think about that question? Um, so if I could only remember my first book that well, um, I think it, the, the first book about the fetus is an endeavor to say, right, when the rabbis are studying, when the rabbis are talking about fetuses um, and projecting all sorts of things about what it means to be Israel, into the womb, they are giving us an answer to what it means to be Israel. And what does it mean to be Israel? It means to believe in a God who delivered you from Egypt, gave you the Torah, and is, and is, is in control of procreation, and that is, is in control of, not in a, like a, you know, like a, a loose control, um, but I think that that's what it is. It means God took you out of Egypt, um, gave you the Torah, and you are, you are in a relationship with that God that comes with stipulations, and that's what it means to be Israel. And is that different from what we know in Torah? Yes. Well, from I mean, that's yeah, because they right, <laughs> totally different for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yes and no. I think I think um, I would tend towards the critical. And say that the right all the fetuses that they in that they that they in talk about or engage with are male. Dina's an example, right? You can't. She she was she was you right. Even they're so male that even if she right. I mean she was female, but we're talking about her because she was at least at one point male. Um, so I think that that in the the critical answer is they're not concerned about Jewish femaleness. And they didn't. They didn't talk about Jewish. They didn't talk about female fetuses, except the one that was male. But again, you know, that's not the answer. We don't have to stop there. And I think we can look for places where uh, certainly Jewish femaleness or is, you know, women of Israel are articulated and articulated against other um, peoples. Yeah. But I don't. I think it would be. Uh, it's. It's about. It's what we look for. It's not paramount on their mind, but we can find it. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, many of the descriptions or the, the quotes were kind of descriptive and acknowledging that certain things, non-binary things, exist. A few did talk about uh, what mitzvot were required or not required. Uh, are there, is there further texts of saying, okay, if there is such an individual, you may or may not do this. I'm, I mean, everyone knows who now shall not sleep with a man as a, a, a man as with a, with a woman, but I mean, are there, do they go on in those texts in, in that regard? Okay, so you've identified this person, but yeah. then, then what? Yeah, so I think the, one of the interesting things about the androgynos and to some extent the tomb tomb is as these border figures, they come up in many of the different tractates. They don't, so interestingly enough, the androgynos, the one text, I can only tell you that the one midrashic text about the androgynos is Adam Harishon. Can't, they don't, so it's a halachic category. Um, and I, and I hesitate to say legal, and I distinguish kind of between legal and halachic. I'm more comfortable hiding behind that um, and leaving it ambiguous about what that is. Um, but so in many places, the, it comes up in um, the question is the it, is raised about um, men are supposed to do this, women are supposed to do this, what's the androgynos? Um, or, you know what, I, I, I take that back. The more common construction is all are obligated to do X, Y, and Z, right? Once we've gone through the list and all, we understand that all is able-bodied male of age people, then we get this other grouping of androgynos, women, slaves, minors, the blind, right? Mentally um, challenged or, you know, um, we get this long list of, of people. And, and so the androgynos and Tuntun come up in, in a ton of cases. Um, hearing the Megillah, right, reading the Megillah, right, um, allowing somebody, right, fulfilling the commandment on behalf of somebody else. Um, it's more a question of where, what I'm interested in is where they don't come up. So they don't come up, the androgynos and tum tum don't seem to come up in sukkahs, like I didn't find anything about an androgynos person sitting in a sukkah. And I wanted it because I, I teach for, you know, I have a handout about Sukkot. And, uh, and so, but they come up for the... Um, almost every, every, if an ox gores a, 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 a girl or boy, right? Uh, I know only girl or boy. What happens if, it, if, if the ox gores an androgynos, right? And so this is where I mean, and the answer is, well, the ox is subject to the same penalty it was if it were, and this is where the language of full boy or full girl is used. So it's not, so in, and that's one of the texts w the, where the text doesn't say, the androgynos is just like a male, except, right? It says that it, the, the same thing applies for this non-binary thing. And so, and there, there are many, there are a lot of examples um, for it. So the, they come, the androgynos and that question and that border issue comes up for a lot of mitzvot. I'm actually pretty, or, or rabbinic texts and questions. I, I'm curious where, when, why, when it doesn't come up, why doesn't it come up? But yeah, so, the ox, um, the value of the of the temple, the the price like price that you would pay, um, comes up. Circumcision, of course, it comes up um, as a question of what to do. Um, yeah, so many places. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, just two short comments and questions. So, you mentioned in the beginning that the rabbis had to be uh, aware of this glaring contradiction between um, the the law and, and, and the Bible. I, I would just maybe point out that maybe the term contradiction suggests, uh, I mean, in, in both cases, we're, we're dealing with individuals who did something in the text, which may or may not have been okay, right? But their reading of, um, of the law, their, their version of the law conflicts with actions of people in the Bible and maybe not with uh, biblical law, so I don't I mean, just in terms of the terminology there. Um, with regard to, to um, um, Mordechai and lactation, which is an awesome text, I don't know if this, um, if this changes anything, but it's worth pointing out, maybe you're well aware of this, that, that it's a relatively well-attested, if rare, phenomenon of men or people with uh, typically male genitalia lactating in, under certain circumstances, and this may reflect that, and that might, may or may not uh, have an impact on how we understand what they're doing there. My, my question is, 
Um, so there were a lot of biblical texts and a lot of rabbinic texts. And um, I didn't see a sharp distinction um, drawn bet between those two. And so do, do you think that there is one? Do you think that the, that the rabbis transformed biblical ideas with regard to sex and gender or, or not? I realize that, as you said in the beginning, I mean, the Bible isn't monolithic and neither is the rabbinic, but do, do you see some sort of transformation or continuity? I think you do see more body malleability in, um, in rabbinic texts, but that might be where I look, right? If I looked at Levitical texts that talked about crushed text testicles and damaged priests, um, I might see a lot of variability for, for bodies in the Bible. Um, so I'll have to, so I'm not sure, but in, uh, but I mean, just on the face of it, there is no word for androgynos or tum tum, um, in the Bible. So these are definitely, you know, they're post-biblical categories. Um, so absolutely, so that language is different, but do I, do I do teach a lot about gender reversal, gender performance, um, gender fucks with Biblical text, yes. So, like, in you know, in respect of my my colleagues in biblical studies, I try not to engage in the one is more than the other. Um, but I would say definitely, right? Androgynos is a Greek loan word. Um, it's not a Hebrew word. It doesn't ha it doesn't exist in the Bible. Um, so there is a there's a difference on that level. Yeah. So there is this text. We understand God created everybody and everything. We, that's a starting point. But Mordecai gr growing breasts that are capable of, of nursing, he's able of nursing Esther. And I think I recall another text where it's an unnamed person who doesn't have the money, and the, there's a miracle that he grows breasts and nurses his baby. Yeah. So the miracle is not that God gives him the money or that he finds the money, but rather that God can make him have the breasts. So my question is, does God ever do something like this to provide some kind of quote-unquote male uh, genitalia to a female, or does it always work that the man gets to also have what women have? So he can be both, but can a woman ever be, so to speak? Uh, so and I think there's an implication. Yes, so I agree. And I, I mean, I think at length about the Mordechai and the Dina text, right, about in terms of gender disparity. I mean, that Mordechai does it better than, than any woman ever would. Um, but having said that, fascinatingly, there is a, there's a perfectly good biblical proof text that Mordechai nurses Esther. In fact, it says Mordechai nurses Esther. I think it's Esther 2.7, um, literally. And it never shows up in the text. So it, it, they just don't, they ignore it and go to the Mishnah. So absolutely, um, the, in the, in the, there is a predominance of maleness doing, up, doing better than femaleness now. But I do think, I mean, we do have Tsipora circumcising her son, but it's not, it's, but in the end of the Babylonian Talmud, I think it's a Vodazara 27, um, that, that, that in fact, she, according to the Babylonian Talmud, she didn't circumcise her son. So. But does a woman ever grow a penis so as to be able to do something? Well, why would a woman need to grow a penis to do what men do? <laughs> I understand. Yeah. No, God does not miraculously. No. No, as far as I know, no. Yeah. But I, I am really, I mean, yeah. No, the gender critique, I think, stands. And, it, you know, had I, had I not been so long-winded and, you know, ambitious about everything else, like, the, it only becomes more pronounced when you look at the parables where you have, you know, God and Israel. It, God is the husband, supposedly, and Israel is the wife. And there's no, there's no females. They're, I mean, they're gone. It's like, it's like the fetuses. They're just disappeared. Um, yeah. But you know this. <laughs> yes. And I agree. I, I agree. Uh, yeah, we are out of time. I'm so sorry, <laughs> um, but um, uh, uh, so I, yeah, I am sorry if, if some people want to continue the conversation, I won't stop you, I see some eager to do that. But um, I do want to say that uh, if nothing else and much else has happened today, I think we are all convinced that the Talmud is a great place to do queer theory. Uh, and everybody should um, 
be studying no, Talmud. Not everybody. No, not every. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for changing our minds. On this.